It's time for the Florida Derby, and I am pleased to be joined for the first time with me. It's been with Sarah before last year from Canterbury Park and Gulfstream Park this year, and she's actually down there in South Florida. It's Angela Herman. Angela, we've known each other for a long time, and it's a pleasure to finally get to handicap a race with you. Agreed. Yes, I know. It's been a long time coming for those sort of things. Thanks for having me on. It's the big one down here at Gulfstream. The big, big one indeed. 100 points to the winner on the Derby Trail, uh, owned by First Racing, so some Preakness implications as well, perhaps. And uh, one thing I've really enjoyed over this winter, seeing you on the signal, of course, familiar with you at Canterbury Park. I'm not sure, and granted, I haven't seen every race you've picked at Gulfstream, so I'm sure it's not over. But in terms of what I've seen, <laughs> you are very reticent to pick a favorite. So I'm I'm eager to see what you did with this Florida Derby. But before we get to that race specifically, I was curious, what is something you've learned this year actually being down there occasionally in the trenches of handicapping Gulfstream Park that maybe surprised you as a handicapper that you didn't really think about before when you were playing via, via simulcast. Anything stick out to you uh, playing golf stream on a more regular basis? I think that the biggest surprise for me has been how different this all weather surface has played to my past experience with it. And uh, we don't mention the track, but I have <laughs> plenty of experience handicapping prior all weather races. And they are an interesting puzzle. They can be very frustrating because there's no one set pattern usually. But even the difference in how horses can take to it and how differently it plays when it rains or anything like that and how much faster generally it is has made me have to reevaluate, I guess, how I look at those sorts of races. I do like them. I think I like them more than the average duck, but uh, it's, because I've tried to learn some of the quirks, you know, uh, on my own. And there's there's trends, there's reports. Obviously, you guys put out a lot of information on handicapping to me. Yeah. But there are prices that can be found that can be the contrarians to those, depending on what class level you're at. And I think that they're the ones that I generally spend the longest on when I'm handicapping, just because there are so many more X factors put into it. And there are some people who really pick up good horses, either claiming them from other tracks where they performed well, where they've been on dirt and trying to reliven them with moving, moving them over to that surface. So I'd say the way that the Tapita plays is a frustration for a lot, but a very interesting puzzle for me. And that's been the biggest surprise. Yeah, not a plan plug by any means, but we do put a lot of effort into the uh, Tapita races here at Horse Racing Nation and have an ebook. So we'll, we'll throw up a link to that as well. I like them too, uh, not necessarily because I'm able to pick a lot of winners. That's still difficult. But I do think horses, for whatever reason, it, it's sort of counterintuitive in my mind because you would think a surface people have trouble with, maybe you wouldn't have so defined favorites. Uh, but even as right before we came on air, there was a horse who was four to five. And granted, it was off the turf. So that's another wrinkle off the turf on the tapita. I mean, I didn't even think the horse was the most likely winner. And now you still got to find the winner. But if you're able to find vulnerable favorites, that's a huge leg up. And I think it, the Tapita Gulfstream seems to have those. Precisely. I think that there's a lot of horses that get played off form that does not apply to that surface at all. That leaves them in a vulnerable position at a low price. And I guess that's probably why I spend more time on them. <laughs> I might not find the winner either. But like you said, I don't take a whole bunch of favorites down here because I mean, just more often than not, there are cases to be made for horses that are switching surfaces so often down here and are coming from the outside so frequently. So try to catch them when you can at a price. And even if I follow them down the road and they're not as big of a price, they're still ones that I like to keep my eye on just because they seem to really move up or really decline when they get to that. All right. Uh, well, from uh, Tapita and maybe not so formful favorites to the dirt and one of the biggest favorites I think we've seen so far this year on the Derby trail. And I, I will bring up the field and these are my fair odds, not the morning line. Uh, but for me, clearly Forte, the horse to beat. I'm curious uh, if you ended up landing in that direction with the full field here. And even if you are on Forte, there are some knocks with the posts, et cetera. I'd be curious how you think he does lose, but would you decide to do with the favorite Angela? I, I mean, I probably will end up with Forte on top. I haven't sent in my selections yet, but I tried to beat Forte last time. I had found 
handicapping pattern with Todd Fletcher. I had done all the digging to try to beat him. And Rocky Cam was very much second best to him. And I don't think that the, the post is going to be enough of a handicap with Forte against this group. Uh, now, that's not to say that I'm going to bet him to win. It's not to say I'm going to play a lot of horizontal sequences with him in it. But if you do like Forte as much as a lot of us do, then you go towards the verticals. You go towards the exactas, the trifectas, pitch out cyclone mischiefs, and some horses that might get over bet and try to utilize that horse that way. I think that's the only way, handicapping wise, you can really make a lot of money with Forte. But if you see him in person, I think he gives me a lot better impression in person than he does on the TV because he's not oh. a, like a big, physical, imposing guy. But. <laughs> I mean, I've told a couple of people if he was a person, and I don't know him as well as his connections do, but just the vibe that he gives, he'd be a jerk. Like, he would be very <laughs> cocky, and he's full of himself. He just knows he's the man when you see him go by you. He's a very confident horse that is following through with what he puts out there that he can bring to the table. He's just in his zone right now. So until he shows that he is out of that zone, I, I'm not going to try to beat him again. Well, he is by violence out of a blame mare, so being a jerk uh, certainly fits the the name of the pedigree. I'm with you, uh, basically to a T. Uh, I don't see who beats him. I'm certainly not excited about betting him at less than his morning line. For whatever reason, he ended up higher than that. Uh, I'm I personally am not opposed to betting horses at even money that I think should be odds on, but. Yeah. I see him as being one to two or three to five. So from a wind pool standpoint, I am looking at the verticals to try to do something. And I didn't know, I just look now and I do see the morning lines out and I am disappointed to see that Fort Bragg is the second choice because in my mind, that was the way to go. Uh, I actually liked him to win the Sunland Park Derby. Maybe they wish they had gone there after what happened, but he is here. Second place gets him in the Derby. But as the second choice, uh, now I'm not so sure he's the one I want underneath either. But I do think he's second best. And he just, I think, has a lot more to prove than Forte does. And as close sure. as they might be on the, well, yeah, as close as they might be on the board, it wouldn't reflect how much more he has to prove. I mean, even if they're, what, seven to one and one to two or something like that. I just, I'm not that impressed with Fort Bragg thus far. I'm not. And usually, my if you ever make it up to Canterbury, uh, you will get the you'll get the rundown that I love the West Coast. You know, I've played <laughs> a lot of California racing for a good part of my life. I usually end up leaning that way with Derby preps, and I'm very impressed with a couple of the horses that have come out of there, but not Fort Bragg. So uh, he was one that I was looking forward to passing on at least in second and third with Trifectus. I don't think I would use him in fourth either. That's not a smart move. I would probably just pitch him all together. Yeah. But I'm interested in a couple more with exactas and stuff because I, I can't honestly say that I think Fort Bragg will run last. I don't think it would be out of the question for him to run third or fourth. So I'm probably going to stick to exactas. That's my preference anyway, but I can't envision him like running completely out of the, out of the mix. Right. No. Uh, well, and like I said, I, the air came out of the balloon when I actually saw the morning line, which, um, you know, maybe it ended up a little closer with the Rems and winner six to one, Cyclone Mischief eight to one. I'm still going to pay attention to the the exact of Will Pays. I guess Mage at ten to one uh, certainly was thrown to the wolves last time, so to speak, and uh, really, you know, had no right to win that race anyway, and didn't. Uh, but you know, was was in the mix, showed some running, uh, and is the what does that make him the fifth choice here at ten to one? Fourth <laughs> choice among those behind Forte. Yeah. I guess I'm a little more interested than maybe I thought I was going to be when I thought he was going to be the second choice. And that's fair. I, I thought he would be the second choice, not to be like, haha, but I just, <laughs> I, I just didn't see much else. Cause I think a lot of people like me weren't that blown away by the Holy bull. So we were looking right. for alternatives. He became the wise guy horse around here and he ran fine. But even before the race, they were kind of like, mm. they didn't think it was going to come up as salty as it did when they first went in, but with no rocket can, then maybe this horse can go and get that seasoning behind him, get a similar trip and finish in a similar spot. But perhaps this time it lands him third or second rather than, you know, the kind of lackluster fourth. But I right. thought that there were a couple of other options that could be thrown in in the mix that we don't know enough about yet doing this sort of thing. Yeah, betting on the come. Before we get to those options, because I know <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. you teased it well, but I do have to ask about Cyclone Mischief. I'm not sure how often you were there for his races uh you know the the holy bull was was a dud 
off that big effort in the previous race. Did show some signs of life last out, though. Uh, based on what you've heard down there, what you've seen when he's run, do you think he takes another step forward to the maiden breaker or is uh, we've seen his best against Stakes Company? Are you talking about Cyclone Mischief or yes. Match? Uh, or Cyclone. Yeah. Cy yeah. Cyclone, Cyclone I was here. I was here that day when he ran in that optional claimer and he was very impressive. Don't get me wrong on that. I liked a horse that might still be running, but <laughs> uh, he, I, I think kind of exposed the vulnerability of that field and his performance was enhanced by a couple that didn't show up in that group. And maybe that came back in the fountain of youth. Now the Holy bowl could be a toss out for him and he did run better in the fountain of youth, but he to me doesn't give me the impression of a horse that is crying out for a whole bunch more distance and a whole bunch more pace competition. Mm -hmm. I think he might get both in this spot that will leave him as a little bit of an underlay on the board. I'm just, I wasn't a Cyclone Mischief fan that day. I really haven't been since. So I'm not going to jump on now when I think there's even more working against him. Yep. Uh, agreed there. And, you know, for whatever reason, we, we love him and appreciate his gregarious nature. Uh, but Dale Romans does move the pools <laughs> and, in the wrong direction uh, if you're a backer of his horses. And if you don't like them, that's good because it, it helps uh, the price on the others you don't. Okay, so we've, we've gone through Forte, yes. So far, the others we've mentioned, no. No. It, it may be taking a, a swing uh, underneath at a price. Who you got? I actually like one of the new purchases for Sappy Joseph. And admittedly, there's some emotion behind it, but he's been a horse that I've followed uh, for quite a while. And Nautical Star ended up here as a surprise, frankly, to me. Mm -hmm. And I talked to his previous connections, that being his previous trainer, and they, the Quinones family bred this horse, raised him, brought him all the way up to that maiden breaker at Oakland. Yes, this is a giant step forward, but I thought that the way that he finished up and some of the greenness that he's shown and his ability to loop around horses, but he still has some speed, and the way that he worked down here when he arrived, We'll leave him at a fair price on the board. I believe you had him at 21 to 1 as fair odds. Yes. I, I would guess he's even higher than that by the time they get to the gate. And at least you know that there's more to come from him, kind of like a mage, where I think that they, they, they won't be forte, but if they can sneak in underneath and some of the underlays get tired and they show a new dimension, I mean, he's got as good a shot as any to improve at this distance. Maybe not yet. Maybe he'll run to his odds. But I'm willing to take a shot on him and maybe eh, not West Coast Cowboy, but a couple of other ones who just don't have enough to them yet for me to completely toss them out. You know, Cyclone Mischief is two for six. You have some horses, two races, three races. And I've caught those kinds before in verticals. I don't use them as much in horizontals, but I mean, I might throw them in on a ticket or two and they pay off sometimes. I just don't. I don't see the rest of the field behind Forte as being anything that in sh should intimidate anybody. So with Nautical Star being one that I know better than some of his competition mm -hmm. and know that there's a lot of upside, he's the way that I would go as far as keying a long shot underneath. Yeah, and I think uh, people ignore to their detriment when you have these fields of 11, 12 horses, uh, Arkansas Derby this week as well, it opens up the – possibility of getting a, a big payout in a in a try or super now i'm with you i actually prefer exacto wagering um just more comfortable with it i like that you can see the will pays but with the 12 horse field even with forte on top if you eliminate the right horses underneath such as a fort bragg is the clear second choice mm -hmm. things can really uh expand price wise so i, I like what you're thinking for this race and as you noted, Nautical Star, who I have, uh, let's bring it back up again, who I have at 21 to 1. I mean, all things considered, given the size of the field and an odds on favorite, that's actually not too short of a price. And he's 30 to 1 on the morning line. So uh, I, I think we're in agreement that there might be some opportunity there. And he's an Oklahoma bred. So <laughs> yeah. uh, Texas bred when it's Sunland, why not an Oklahoma bred at Gulfstream? Well, yeah, the family. His family, Nick Quinones, his family, I mean, you would know Luis Quinones, Alonzo Quinones, a lot of them are, you know, racing's in their blood. And they went out and got this mare from California, enfolded Dixie Chatter, brought her to Oklahoma. And 
I, I mean, they really didn't have big plans for her, but Nautical Star, I think, turned out to be a nice surprise for them. And I know that, I mean, he's one of the best ones that I've seen in a while uh, go into the Florida Derby as an Oklahoma bred. Can't remember the last one, to be <laughs> honest. But uh, he's really got a lot of potential. And what he's shown in his first two starts at Oakland, and I mean, those maidens are some of the saltiest you'll see. I know that I've seen a lot of very talented horses here, see a lot of them in California. But you get some very good ones at Oakland at the beginning of the season. And he came from behind and looped a lot of them. And he can outfinish them. I mean, he outfinished a really nice horse, even though it was only by this much. There, it still <laughs> it yeah. leaves, it leaves you with a lot to hope for, as opposed to hoping that they'll go back to what they were. You want to hope to see what they become. And even if he doesn't turn out to be this type in the future, you still are going to get him at a better price today. Even if he does run his race and he does manage to get a piece of it, you're not going to get nearly that price next time. So why not? Well, I think uh, you gave horse racing's new tagline. <laughs> it gives you a lot to hope for. <laughs> wow. You eternal optimist. I knew something like that was going to come out of you. I just didn't know when. <laughs> and any gambler can relate or horseman. For that hope springs uh, eternal. Is that a absolutely. recycling of that? <laughs> Well, this was a whirlwind tour of the Florida Derby field. Angela, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. This was long overdue. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me, and uh, hopefully we come up with some money at the end of the Florida Derby. I think uh, with uh, with Nautical Wish. Star. Nautical Star. Star. Thank you. <laughs> not Wish. David Nautical Hopkins, Star. Not There's opportunity there. I, I, like, I like where we're going with this race. So <laughs> we'll see what happens, and uh, certainly we'll do this again if you don't mind. I would love to catch you for the Minnesota Derby if we can't link up beforehand. There you go. It's a plan. All right. She's Angela Herman. I'm Ed DeRosa. Good luck, everybody.